Today's guest is Eve Rodsky. She wrote the book, Fair Play. Fair Play gamified the life management system that helps partners rebalance their domestic workload and reimagine their relationship. She's elevated the cultural conversation about the value of unpaid labor and care, and she actually gives us a system based on her Harvard-trained background in organizational management to ask the simple yet profound question, what would happen if we treated our homes as our most important organizations? Her New York Times bestselling book, Fair Play, was one of Reese's book club picks, and she followed that book up with a new book called Find Your Unicorn Space on how to reclaim your creative life in a too busy world. So let's welcome Eve to the show. All right, Eve, I'm so excited to have you. I have wanted to interview you since our Dr. Becky event um, last year, and it's just been getting on each other's calendar that was a little difficult because we're both, you know, working mamas (laughs) trying to protect our unicorn space. And um, But I want everyone to get to know you and the work that you're doing because I think it's so profoundly important being that so many moms walk around with this layer of guilt for the time that they take for themselves away from their children, away from their spouse, away from their work. And uh, you've really given a voice to this. So thank you so much for being here and for taking the time to write such a transformative book. Well, thank you, Kelly. I feel the same way. I was so excited after our Dr. Becky time to get to be with you one-on-one. So thank you for having me. Yeah. Well, can we talk a little bit about, um, for people who don't know you work, um, you wrote a book called Fair Play, where you you talk about really the inequalities in households and with caregivers, um, even between, you know, spouses. Uh, We carry a lot as the female, whether it's a matriarch Mm -hmm. or like in our families, and it leaves little time for us to really even explore our creative space, which is why you wrote your second book and your newest book, Find Your Unicorn Space. So can you can you talk a, bit, a little bit about the work you do and what you're so passionate about? Well, thank you for saying that. I guess we carry a lot. And no, I did not expect to be an expert on any of these issues, especially the gender division of labor. There's actually a name for it, Kelly. But um, I'll say in my third grade, what do you want to be when you grow up board and Miss Hornstein's class, I think it probably said astronaut at that point. <laughs> um, and it, I will say gender division of labor expert was not at all, even on my radar when I went to law school. Um, I remember Elizabeth Warren was our orientation teacher and she asked, what will you do with your law degree? And being resolutely Gen X, we were told um, we had none of the issues of our parents, that women were graduating from law schools and business schools at rates um, that were unprecedented that we were in politics, we were in business, uh, that we should ignore our gender. And so that's what I did. And I had big dreams, right? I guess I thought I was going to be president of the United States, probably, or um, the CEO of a company or um, a senator. Or at one point, I thought I'd be senator and president at the same time and still be a big <laughs> city dancer because I wasn't going to give up my dream of dance. You know, I, you could do it all. Um but I think that that was the sort of the vibe of the early 2000s. I graduated law school in 2002 with this idea that I was going to be like smashing glass ceilings or the patriarchy um, along the way. And then you cut to 2011, where my fair play journey begins. And really, honestly, the only thing I could tell you that I was probably smashing in 2011 was um, peas for my toddler. Yeah. Uh, that was Zach while breastfeeding a newborn baby, Ben. Um, And that's where the fair play journey began because in that moment of having my second son, Ben, I was feeling so abandoned um, by my workplace first because as I was trying to come back to work, I was told I would have no direct reports. I was told that if I wanted to pump, it would be in a, like, you know, a broom closet basically with no ventilation and probably like no light. I'd have to use like, you know, my phone as a flashlight. So that was the environment I was coming back to. So I ended up quitting and starting my own law firm. But at the same time, when I was on that maternity leave, my husband, Seth, um, and I talk about this a lot in Fair Play, right? He sends me a text that says, I'm surprised you didn't get blueberries. And I have this blueberries breakdown on the side of the road over feeling like, wow, you know, this is where our relationship has come to. I'm 
the fulfiller of his smoothie needs. Um, <laughs> I'm in charge of everything for our house. I'm the default, or as I call it, the she fault for literally every single household and domestic task for my family. While he gets to watch Sports Center, work out, finish a PowerPoint deck, go to work whenever he wants, come home whenever he wants, not take paternity leave because there wasn't any. Um, so emotionally abandoned by my partner. And that's sort of when this, this work started because it was the realization that I was emotionally abandoned and physically abandoned from my workplace and my partner and thinking like, where, where can I go? And then the last piece was everyone told me where I was going to go was my preschool community, that things were going to get easier once my kids were in school, Kelly. And I remember around this time of the blueberries breakdown and quitting my job. Now I say I'm for, I was forced out, but I go to this community that I was waiting for that everybody told me was going to be my social safety net. And the preschool teacher had us all sitting in a circle, welcoming us to this new community and telling us that the people around us were going to help us with everything and be our, our support system. And they were going to know us better than anyone's ever known us. And then I looked out at my name tag from that toddler transition day. Um, and it says Zach's mom. Yeah. So I kept thinking, these are the people that are going to know me better than anyone's ever known me. They don't even know my fucking name. Yeah. And that was it. It was the fact that there was this cloud of overwhelm and erasure of my identity that felt completely unsustainable. And I couldn't, I couldn't do it anymore. Yeah. I mean, you, you state a, a stat in your, in your book, Fair Play, that 93% of childcare work is done by a mom and that there are 43 tasks parents are expected to do before they leave the house. And if yes. 93% of those 43 tasks are on women, that's a lot of work that primarily doesn't have to do with us fulfilling our own dreams or taking care of ourselves or putting our own oxygen mask on. But this is the crazy thing, Kelly, was that I didn't know this. And again, I consider myself highly educated. I consider myself a feminist. But I literally thought my partner and I were fighting because uh, it was cold outside, you know, or I, I had no idea that there was a name for what we were experiencing, like you said that this had been talked about before since the 1960s. I'd never heard that in all of my education. I in, And my mother, who's a single mother, who's a professor of social change, I had never heard the, the term invisible work. Right. I had never heard the term second shift. Or maybe I'd heard it, but, but dismissed it. I had never heard the term emotional labor or mental load before I had kids. And those are all terms for what we're talking about. Actually, invisible work became my favorite term, Kelly, because that was coined in 1986 by a sociologist named Arlene Kaplan Daniels. And why I love that term, invisible work, so much was because, like you said, those 43 tasks, um, they're, they're, her argument was that they have to remain invisible for a late stage capitalist patriarchy to work. Because mm -hmm. if you make those tasks visible and valued, then women, won't do them anymore, mm -hmm. that we will now have to pay for those tasks and, and life will be too expensive. That exploiting unpaid labor is sort of what we've done as a society. Um, and it comes out of our legacy of slavery, but that we, we have to have women do unpaid labor, that we do $1.9 trillion of unpaid labor a year in the United States, um, because that's how we have a functioning society. So that's why it has to be invisible, because God forbid it becomes visible then it's very dangerous for the people in power. And so that was really hard for me to come out and try to say my work is going to be about making the invisible visible because I got a lot of pushback. Yeah. Well, before this podcast started, we were just casually talking. You know, I think about all the things that are open tabs in my brain of Sebastian needs a bigger set of, of shoes. I need to go on Amazon or I need to go buy those tonight. And Valentine's Day is coming up. And we got that, you know, that email from preschool that are supposed to be the support, you know, yes, the support yes. family group, right? Like I am in that right now. And it's like, hey, can someone bring uh, four strawberries times 18 yes. kids cut into hearts tomorrow? Who will yeah. volunteer? Yes. And it's like, I volunteer for tribute. You know, like it's, 
you're throwing yourself. It is Hunger Games. Yes, into it is, the feels fire every day, and it does. It does. It's not less. It's more. It's more tasks when you know you're you're creating this environment and this childhood for your kids, and you want to give them a life at, as good as what you had or better. And it's so. Let's talk about. And by the way, I will say that that I've become really, really annoying, a thorn in the side of all our schools because. I keep sending to the principal of my son's uh, middle school the fact that his the entire board of that school is 75% men and the entire PTA is 100% women. Yeah. And so once a month, I just say, reminder, what are we doing about this? Reminder, what are we doing about this? In fact, in my kids' elementary school, um, I made such a stink about it that I said, if you have another woman who leads the PTA, um, I'm going to start talking about you yeah. on social media. And so finally we had a wonderful, um, lead dad named Peter who stood up and said, I will be the president of the PTA. I love that. So shout so, out to you, Peter. Yay, Peter. We love you, Peter. I mean, Chris, my husband is a stay at home dad and he's a recovering attorney is what he likes to call himself. Um, and he is so on it, like so helpful. He knows the kids schedules. He, you know, will notice when there are groceries and he'll start to fill the cart online for pickup or whatever the case may be. But there are just, there's a level of attention to detail on other things that I think are maternal. Um, that are hard to quantify. Well, condition like said, to be, yes. condition to be maternal. Because what I was able to find out when I was, it took me nine months, but I was able to finally quantify that invisible work over nine months that I put into a spreadsheet, Kelly, called the Shit I Do spreadsheet. I was even able to quantify the things that people were calling maternal. So what was interesting was that there were these expectations or assumptions, um, but they're actually just more invisible work. And so that was really interesting and cool because people saw certain cards, I call them cards. So the, so fair play, just for people who are unfamiliar with the work, um, is a metaphor. It's a game. Uh, it's a love, it became a love letter to men. So, you know, we may be talking sort of rage and anger here, but as one man said to me, I like to go dark to go light. There's a, there is some rage, but there's also a lot of solutions. And um, one of the most beautiful things about fair play is that these things that were assumed to be maternal, like what this one woman said was that, you know, she was assumed to have a magical vagina that whispered in her ear <laughs> what her husband's mother wanted for Christmas, right? All, what I realized that was, was it was just assumptions. Yeah. And we know now that one of the best ways to end bias is to move from assumption to structured decision-making. So even who buys the flowers for a kid at a recital is now in fair play, which became this metaphor, this 100 cards um, that you break down into ownership of the conception, planning, and execution. It's not just you show up at a Little League field. It's that you're on the 85-person text chain, and you're also the person who buys the equipment, and you're also the person who logs onto the portal and surveys your kid's friend's for what sports they want to play. That ownership mindset is what fair play became. And so when you own a card, it doesn't have to be 50-50, but the goal is full com and complete ownership. So the maternal cards, which was so interesting, so there were cards that were more visible, like dishes, mm -hmm. and there were cards that were more visible, like lawn and plants, or there were cards that were more visible, even like homework. Yeah. But there were cards that were e of the invisible work, like dishes and homework. There were cards that were even more invisible. And those were the ones that were likely to be considered maternal, aka middle of the night comfort, which is one card, aka um, magical beings, which is the tooth fairy and Santa and lucky leprechaun. And so I decided to make that its own separate suit. So there's a card suit called home. There's one called out. And that's where sort of more, most men married to women were playing in. But then there's a suit called caregiving, and then there's one called magic. And when men start to take on those tasks, they start seeing the connection in their lives increase. And so it's really becomes a win-win for everybody. Oh, 
that resonates so, so deeply with me because I see the connection Chris has with our kids and it has to do with the effort that he puts in with them. Like he's Shout back. out to you, Chris. There's yeah. a whole lead, lead dad movement now to also see your <laughs> invisible work because again, because this work is invisible and it's not valued, yes, you may get a few more like on the playground, wow, you're a great dad, but we know that this work is not valued and that affects lead dads as much as it does stay-at-home moms. Yes. And it's funny because the interview before this was with sex therapists and he's yeah. love language is compliments and communication. And I need to tell him more all about the well, invisible Well, Chris, I'm work. doing that for you. Yes, yeah. I'm doing that for you <laughs> right you, now. Thank you, Eve. <laughs> no, it's... it. I What I love is it, you've really taken the job description of mom and dad. And instead of having this 14 page, you know, list for mom, you've put it all in cards. You've taken it from your Excel sheet, the should I do spreadsheet, and you've put it into cards. You've allowed people to take ownership, to connect with their kids, to connect with their family, to connect with their spouse or, you know, whoever they're leading their family with to, to, to not have this be invisible work, to really um, have it be work that we're grateful for, that we own. And, and then there isn't, we, I mean, I will say right now, as a parent of toddlers, who is pregnant with our third son? Yay, congratulations. Like, thanks. Who, you know, it it becomes a lot. You just have all these open tabs in your computer brain. It's a lot. Oh my God, it's and, a lot. And then you feel bad because you constantly feel like you're dropping the ball because in our sort of reverse traditional household, it is really confusing a lot of times was, well, you're the stay-at-home dad. So you're supposed to read the classroom emails. And yes, I want to be the mom that like drops them off at school and delivers the cookies, but can you procure the cookies for me? Because I'm no, no. doing podcasts Kelly, all day. Kelly, I don't like that. No, <laughs> he's not procuring your cookies Obviously. because what I want to say, say to you and to say to Chris is that Chris's job is a 24-hour job and you get breaks and you get human interaction. And so what I will say is actually... The Chris job is actually can't be fulfilled by one person. So yeah. I w I want you to own certain things. I don't want you. The problem when when it's reverse roles is that women are still assumed to do the most. So the school will call you and you're like, "What the hell are you doing calling me?" Yeah, or whatever it is. So you have to sort of bat off and create your boundary. But within your boundary of no assumptions, when you have the Chris as the lead dad, I still want you to have at least um, some cards. Oh, absolutely. I right. and 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 it's hard for me too because I didn't assume to have a reverse role or like reverse traditional role. I grew up in a very traditional household. My mom was a stay-at-home mom. I have a a nice thick layer of guilt for being yes, the working yes, yes. breadwinner and we'll jump into your next piece of work to talk about how yes, I dismantle please. that and create that space, but but it's weird because there are definitely even times when I get mad at him for doing stuff that I would have wanted to do. Mm -hmm. oh, I picked up this thing for Valentine's Day or I snagged this and I'm like, I'm, the, I'm supposed to do that because I think it's, you know. No, ingrained. I won't let you do that either. I won't <laughs> let you do that either. But I will get my Over homework assignment to both of you is to, to look at the magic suit. Okay. Because that sounds like the suit that you we keep going back to, right? Um, that maybe you're both sharing in a way that's not as productive as if you be dealt or owned it and you had it one week and then Chris had it one week. So I will say there's the magic suit in fair play. So that's my homework to go back and to look at the way the cards are structured and look at specifically at caregiving and magic because it sounds like those are the ones where you're overlapping because those that's the real invisible, invisible work. Um, and that's where you can, but can I tell you, I'll tell you one story before we move into guilt and shame and how we uh, burn that okay. <laughs> for your listeners and move into being interested in our own lives, which is really the only antidote to burnout is to be consistently interested in our own lives. And it's hard to do that when, especially when we have toddlers and it's hard to do that as women often. Um, so we'll go there, but I want to just give you one small story that I, I didn't, it didn't get in the book because it happened during the pandemic. But I think for people who are not sold on the ownership model or we both do everything or this sounds like too much work, I will say that there was this couple during the pandemic, I call them Richard and Amy because I didn't get permission to use their real names, but 
they um Richard involved father, um, but more traditional role where Amy was taking on more of the work. And the, what it made me think of was because we were just talking about the magic suit, like this idea of the invisible, invisible work. So what Richard had realized was that he was actually taking on a lot of the Amazon returns and the lugging, you know, shit to UPS and the dishes and meal planning, which are very, very important. But actually the magic stuff, uh, he felt like he didn't really know who was handling that. And it was getting very confusing. So he decided to clarify that he wanted to be the tooth fairy because one of the cards in the magic suit is called magical beings. And that's who is the tooth fairy, who is Santa Claus. And this family, actually, they have lucky leprechaun because they have Irish descent. I didn't know that was existed, actually. So that was cool for me to learn. So this father in the context of fair play, sitting down, having high cognition, low emotion conversations. I always recommend to have a check-in with your partner if you can. Most people do not practice communication with their partners. So they start to practice communicating. 10 minutes a night, they checked in before they brushed their teeth. What's going on for the next day? Who's owning what? So he knew that he was in charge of Tooth Fairy now. That was handed over to him. but. The night that his daughter lost her second tooth, the tooth fairy didn't come. Oh. And so what Amy told me the dynamic in their marriage would have been before fair play was she would have been a verbal assassin and said, you're done. Like, do not do not try to involve yourself in my kids' lives. You ruin their magic. You've like ruined their life. She's never going to believe in anything again. Like she would have gone straight to that type mm-hmm. of language at him. And he would have, in turn, he said, blamed her for not reminding him to put the dollar under the pillow. Mm -hmm. So I loved how self-aware they were of what their pre-dynamic was, but their post-dynamic was that fair play is about ownership. So the first thing he did was he, back to love languages, her love language is accountability. So he took accountability and said, I messed up. That was, and then once he did that, she was able to say, okay, well, part of fair play is carrying through your mistakes. So our daughter's upset. I'll let you figure it out. So he, in front of his daughter, emails toothfairy at gmail.com. And actually he gets a response later, which is so weird because he did not think anybody would respond. He's like, what the hell is this response? (laughs) So he emails toothfairy at gmail.com saying, what happened? You know, did you not find our house? Was it cloudy? Did you miss us? And he gets a response from the tooth fairy saying, you know, due to supply chain issues, I'm really backed up in teeth and I'll be there tonight. He prints that email out for his daughter and says, when the tooth fairy is late due to supply chain issues, uh, she brings double the money. (laughs) And that was the end. That was the end of the story. So the reason why I love that story is because I think it's so small. He's still the tooth fairy for his daughter. She sometimes asks, is the tooth fairy coming on time or will I get double the money? But I think because he was allowed to own that and carry through his mistake, my belief is that he's going to, A, continue to do magical beings with stuff and also have stories and connections with his daughter that he wouldn't have had before. Oh, it's such a heartfelt story. And it also is real life. Like just because we're parents doesn't mean we don't really mess up. Like these things happen to us all the time. And it's true. I would have been like, I can't count on you. Give, right. me, the, it's give over. me the magical being card. Yes, I'm taking it I back. Yeah, do yep. it myself. I'm yep, getting in yep. the car. I'm driving to the ATM. <laughs> you, you know, it doesn't matter to you. I should take it back because you don't value it. But yeah. the truth is that if we keep saying, well, I value this more, so I should take it on, then women, even breadwinning women like you, Kelly, will end up really getting sick. And I saw that in my research that, if we have that mentality, well, I value it more, so I should do it. We will literally get sick. And we can't, I can't have women getting sick. I'm the ghost of your Christmas future. I want women to live in their full, vibrant lives. Yeah. And so that's why we're talking now about uh, not only just handing over tasks, but now making the space to be consistently interested in your own life, which is the real true antidote to burnout. Well, and you don't even have the time to be interested in your own life when there is no division of labor, when you are doing all the invisible Correct. work, when you're carrying all the emotional baggage, the burden, the mental, you called it the the mental load. 
Like mm-hmm. that, that feels like it's my job. And then I become a resentful martyr or, right. you know, a not a great wife. And it's, I just, it's one thing to say, set boundaries, ask your husband to do more, but they don't know what you're asking them to do. Correct, or if correct. it's flipped, it's the same. It's not clear. There's, you don't have your job description and you haven't taken ownership. So you can't show up or in the case of Richard, make amends or fix a problem that you've created. Like he showed, I mean, and he'll eventually tell his daughter that the tooth fairy yeah, isn't real or yeah. she'll figure it out. And she'll see that, that your parent, his, her parents aren't perfect and they make mistakes and they can move through that and find the answers. So I just thank you for creating a system that allows us to, to really see all this invisible work that took a long time and to de- really divide those tasks so that there isn't resentment, so that there isn't, you know, fighting or, or, you know, I guess build up in one another, because those are the things, you know, those are turn offs in a relationship that drive people apart. But what I love that you said about boundaries was I think it's so interesting because there really is a secret formula. And I think we're going to be talking, we'll move into that boundaries piece now, because we just spent the first part of this podcast talking about, um, sort of how fair play originated. And my day job is that I work for families that look like the HBO show Succession. I'm a lawyer for those families. And so I knew from working with the families that a healthy organization and my aha moment was, I want to start treating our homes like our most important organizations, Mm -hmm. have boundaries, systems, and communication. Mm -hmm. And that's why oftentimes some of this advice feels so essentialistic because it's like, just have boundaries or tell your partner what they want to do. Like, it's not at that easy. Fair play is a card game and it's a book. And it was researched over, it came out in 2019 after writing it in 2018. I was still researching then. So yeah, so from 2011, so seven years of research and beta testing in 17 countries, right? This, if it was easy just to adopt ownership in the home, yeah. we would do it. Because yeah. even my Aunt Marion's Mahjong group, has ownership. You don't bring snack twice to the group you're at, right? (laughs) But the home, as one man said to me, he's wait every single night, he waits to decide who takes the dog out right when it's about to take a piss on the rug. So the reason why it's not easy is because of the unicorn space themes, like what we're launching into now. So systems is where I started because I could do systems. Mm. Systems, there's 50 years of scholarships on how to do systems. And so I knew if I could use some of that sort of project management um, world and and read the handbooks on organizational management and see what people have done in the workplace for 50 years, I would be able to have a home system that is based um, or inspired by those principles. But the problem why it's never been done before was because the boundaries and the communication. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to communic- communicate, as we said, what Amy would have done if it ha- she hadn't been within the system, right? The verbal assassin, mm-hmm. her partner would probably have, he said his love language or the opposite, his communication language is, is avoidance. Mm-hmm. Hers was getting big and um, this verbal assassin tone. Mm-hmm. So to move away from that is really this conversation we're getting into now, which is boundaries. Because the problem is it's really hard to set up systems and to communicate if we don't believe that we deserve a permission to be unavailable from our roles. Mm -hmm. And that unlearning, Kelly, is why this work is so triggering for many, many people. Because I am here to tell you, right, that availability is not part of your identity. And I remember one of my exercises in my research was to ask women to close their eyes and picture the school calling them and to not pick up the phone. Mm -hmm. And the stress response women were getting, even in vi- in that visioning exercise, they were saying that they were starting to sweat. Their heart was pounding thinking of that scenario. So we've been conditioned as women to put availability over everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and that we are parents, partners, and professionals. And we are available to those identities. God forbid we want to be anything outside of those identities. And that's when society completely pushes us into these, it just says, no, 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 no. And we will um, guilt and shame you until you stop 
trying to be anything other than a parent or a partner or a professional. Yeah. Well, you spend so much of your adolescence growing up and trying to get to know yourself and and be passionate about your hobbies. And you have all this time and space to think, create, manifest, and then maybe you couple off and you've segregated part of your life to being there as a partner. And then you've, you know, or you've started your professional career and you identify as being, you know, a successful, independent working woman. And then you have kids and and it does, it feels like that pie is just being taken up by all of those things. And they're that sliver that was left for you or even meeting your girlfriends for a coffee or going for a, a hike or getting your workout in, it kind of all shrinks. And if you didn't have that modeling right. from your parent, then there's also a level of guilt around that's not what you should be doing and that that's selfish or it's taking away. What's interesting is I look at my professional career and the beginning of my career as a nutritionist after I was working in cancer and genetics and I started my own business, I was available 24 Mm seven clients could text me at any time. I would drop everything and answer, you know, I'd be on a date with Chris. I'd be out with friends. I'd step out of the apartment where we were watching Mm -hmm. a movie together or whatever I was to answer, to call, to call them back, to immediately email. And then as the years went on and I valued my own work, I was able to set boundaries and say, you know, today now with a family and toddlers, I take, client Zoom calls on Mondays and Thursdays. And if they can't make those days, there's rarely a time where I'm moving my schedule around because Tuesdays, which is today, I block schedule all of my podcast interviews. And this is the day that I'm available. And in my past life, like years ago, I'd say, oh, you can't do that. Okay, let me move this around and I'll move that around. And I'm constantly sending rescheduling emails, but I feel... It's it's so sad that I've had to have such a runway to create, to realize my worth, to create boundaries and to build my own life, not to be reactive to everyone else's schedule, but to own my schedule and own those boundaries. What I have the hardest time with, and it's so hard being a nutritionist and a health coach and telling people to prioritize their workouts and prioritize their personal time and prioritize reading that chick lit, lit book that they yes. love or whatever it is that makes them feel happy and creative and, and alive. Um, when it's the hardest thing for me to do, it's also my job to tell them to do that. Yeah. And it's such this sticky place, which is why I love the work that you've done because I don't know. I mean, you're the expert why did I have to earn it? And how do I just own it now? Well, I think it's such a great question because um, the reason why I love your work is, you know, I've talked to many people who work on in health and even the suggestion, I spoke to one woman who said to me that that her suggestion to her client that she drink a glass of water in the morning was met with such aversion because this woman said, well, you want me to wear Depends? Because I do three different drop-offs every day. And so I'm not going to, you know, be putting my car in the red to run in to take a piss at the school. So like literally it's either depends or I stay dehydrated till midday, right? Yeah. And so even as a health nutritionist, this woman was saying, I can't even make a basic fundamental, very, very small habit change in this woman's life because she's telling me she was gonna have to pee. So I think this goes so much deeper and you're, you recognize that, right? That these boundaries that you had to earn over time were probably ones that hopefully would be there for you earlier. But like you said, it hadn't really been modeled for us by that last, the generation before us, which really having it all meant doing it all. And I think, um, I haven't asked this as a, as a scientific question, but I bet you that, um, I would hear from that generation, especially that they were more comfortable with being called selfless mm-hmm. than they would be as being called selfish. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that anecdotally, because back to my, I sometimes go dark to go light. Uh, I have a lot of people who, who reach out to me after funerals, mm-hmm. um, for many different reasons, but often because on DMS or, uh, email info at Eve Rodsky, people will email me and say, I went to a funeral today. And I just want to let you know that this woman was called selfless and mm-hmm. the entire funeral was about her, what, she did to build up these other people. So it was basically a resume of her kids 
and her partner and their accomplishments because she supported those. And so the these people are re- reflecting on that's not the life they want to live or the legacy they want to leave. Yeah. One woman said to me, you know what? I was I was okay doing it all until you sh- showed me that it's not okay for my daughters to watch me do it all. And I think especially our sons too. And that's really the the goal here. The goal here is to say this if we're if we're in a boundary systems and communication formula and the and you're convinced that the systems and communication can work like it did with the Richard and Amy uh story, the hardest part like you said, Kelly, will be boundaries because it's just not easy. And and the, and the reason why is because society doesn't want it to be easy for us. Like I said, we are allowed to be parents, partners, and professionals. Professionals because we have to earn money because of the income inequality in this country means that it's really hard to make it work in America. We don't have universal child care or even paid leave. So, and we don't have access to health insurance. So we have a lot of resources that have to go to earning. But what happens so often is that since birth, since we've been conditioned to believe our time is infinite, like sand, um, and men's time is finite, like diamonds, that conditioning, no matter what family structure you're in, really um, hurts women because we become complicit in our own oppression. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is we see things like people telling us that breastfeeding is free when it's really an 1800 hour a year job, or we see women enter male professions or have their own professions because actually nutrition is, um, is, is an occupationally segregated, uh, profession where more women enter it. So the salaries are automatically going to be lower than they would be in preventative health than it would be if you were a surgeon. Mm -hmm. So we know that, and you've been conditioned to believe not you, but that our time is more valuable because society told us that. Mm -hmm. And then we become complicit in our own oppression where we say to ourselves, I can find time. Mm -hmm. My partner is better at focusing on one task at a time. Let me find the time. We say things like, in the time it takes me to tell him, her, they what to do, I should do it myself. We say things to us like, this is maternal. I should be able to know how to do this. um, Or I'm a better multitasker. I'm wired differently as a mother to notice that. So we start to say these things to ourselves that make us all complicit in our own oppression. And that's the hardest part because for me, it was that multitasking badge that somehow I'm a better multitasker. I can, I'm wired differently to see it all. And I remember sitting down with a a neuroscientist who said to me, Eve, there's no difference in how women's brains multitask from men's brains. If there's a gender issue, it just doesn't work that way. Gender is a construct. Um, task switching is bad for everybody. And in fact, he said, I believe that this has been societally happening because when we convince you that you're better at wiping asses and doing dishes, and you hold that as a badge of honor, then your time is now wiping asses and doing dishes and my leisure time as a man is protected. Mm -hmm. So long answer to say boundaries, when people say to you, set your boundaries, speak up, asking for what we need is not easy. And mm-hmm. it takes a lot of unlearning because again, this has been con- conditioning us since birth. And I'm now, and you're now telling people to throw off everything that they've thought and they've learned mm-hmm. since, they, since they've been born. No, this is a 101. And it took you time because you had to unlearn certain mm-hmm. behaviors that you were taught availability and all these other you know, subjugating yourself to others was considered valuable. Even in our religious systems, I'm from an Orthodox Jewish family, um, but but it's very similar to Mormons who t- say to me that men are called the priests and women are called helpers. Mm-hmm. It's very similar in, my, in the Orthodox Jewish tradition as well. So even our religion is trying to incul- inculcate us to this idea that women should have no time other than in those roles of parent, partner, and profession. Mm -hmm. Well, I definitely wear those badges of multitasker and I can do this faster or I care more, so I should just do it. Like that's, that's definitely all the things that are so deeply ingrained inside of me. And that's why I love your you know, I love that there's a card deck and it's yes. the separation of tasks because then I'm freeing up time 
in my week to be unavailable. I can easily set boundaries and be unavailable to my work life for my kids now. It's just, it it feels so important to me, but putting myself in that place of being unavailable for myself, it does. It feels quote unquote selfish Selfish and wrong. Exactly, yes. But it's in those moments that I'm so much more efficient for my for in my career that I show up so much better for my children. I, you know, having to and then ha- being slightly sleep deprived with some sleep issues. I am I got help invested in someone who could help us yes, get yes. Our, my children sleeping because that was a boundary that I couldn't set because I needed to be the caregiver in the middle of the night and being the working person was pushing the easy button by breastfeeding or just soothing them back to sleep or jumping in bed with them. And I had developed some bad habits that was really wrecking my sleep. I've ultimately set boundaries for that. But but when it comes to setting boundaries for ourselves to protect our unicorn space, what does that look like? Because it's one thing to say, like you said, set boundaries for yourself. Give me an example of a day, a week, or a conversation someone might have with their spouse or their family around setting boundaries for themselves? Well, let's give two exercises. One, I will ask, we'll do three exercises. One, and you can pick any of these if you want to practice setting boundaries. One would be the homework assignment of saying, I want you to have report back to Kelly or me that the most important thing you do that day in the next week, one day of the next week is outside your roles. So you will say to me, I, as one woman did in the Rockaways, I jumped into the Atlantic Ocean. This is a unicorn space. It has curiosity, connection, and completion. She was feeling isolated. So I always say the exercise is pick what you're lacking. Are you lacking in curiosity, connection, or completion? For her, she was feeling isolated during the pandemic. She found on Facebook that there was a polar bear group in her neighborhood. (laughs) She joined this group and she jumped into the Atlantic Ocean. So she reported back to me the most important thing she did that day was jumping into the Atlantic Ocean as a polar bear. And that was not in service of her work as a parent or a partner or a professional. How often can we say that that's something that we've done? That's a true unicorn space. Um, Oftentimes, like this podcast, I will say, Kelly, this is a unicorn space for you because it has curiosity, connection, and the hard thing of actually completing an episode and editing it and putting it out there, even if you don't love the way you sound or whatever, <laughs> but that those three steps of, but because it's also tied to your work, I would say you need even more unicorn space, not you need less people whose job is part of their curiosity, connection and completion actually need more. They need more things not tied to their livelihood. So it's not selfless. It's not self selfish. It's selfless for you to be able to actually invest in yourself, as we said, because it does help those other areas. Um, So that's one exercise. Find a day and report back that the most important thing you did that day was outside of those roles. Exercise number two is if that one, you feel like I'm not ready for that one. Number two would be grab a moleskin or a legal pad and start a guilt and shame journal. This is one of my favorite exercises to create boundaries. And what you do with it is you write down in the moment or in advance, if you're about to do something, because guilt and shame are weird emotions, Kelly. They're not like anger or sadness. They're emotions we change our behaviors right away as mothers from. So I feel guilty. I'm not putting Anna to bed tonight. I'm canceling the dinner. Mm -hmm. So to to interrupt that cycle of of canceling things that are actually good for us, or like not drinking the water because I have to pee, Mm -hmm. Um, start a guilt and shame journal, which means you will start writing, I feel guilty because I'm not putting Anna to bed tonight. Mm -hmm. And then what I want you to do is cross out, I feel guilty because, and instead write, I made the decision because. I made the decision not to put Anna to bed tonight because I haven't seen Kelly in a while. And I really know when I see Kelly and catch up with her as a friend, it fills me up for for the week or for the month. And I want to invest in friendships. The cool thing about the guilt and shame journal, which I started last year, was that if you look back at the things we feel guilty for, it becomes almost laughable. Mm-hmm. So I felt guilty for like grabbing coffee and 
not showing up for like silly hat day at my kid's school. And I'm like, what is wrong with me? Who cares? So with distance, you can see how unhelpful guilt and shame is in a way you can't see it in the moment. So that's exercise number two, the guilt and shame journal. And finally, another way you can practice boundaries is to pick something that you love to do. Um, And again, hopefully it has like a share with the world component. So maybe it's, let's say we're picking, signing up for a 5K, right? That has a community component, a share with the world. It's not just a solo run, which is self-care. It's what we call a unicorn space because it has a community, that connection component of being with others. So you sign up for the run and then you say to yourself, what values does this bring up for me? So one woman did this for me. She said, I love to run outdoors. And so I said to her, that's great. And she says, I want to make more space for that. I said, that's not going to help you create a boundary. What's going to help you create a boundary is if you tell me the values behind it. So the values for why she loves to run outdoors, she told me, were peace, freedom, and serenity. And when I pushed her, and she'd never thought about that as a values, she thought about it as an activity. When she thought about it as peace, freedom, and serenity, she said to me, I have none of those in my life. I have no freedom. I have no peace. I have no serenity. So of course I'm seeking out this activity. If you think of it as a value system, I deserve peace, serenity, and freedom in my life. You're going to be much more likely to set that boundary as on a values level than as an activity level. So pick one of the three in the menu. Right. It is, it's heavy to think that we deny ourselves it just those basic human needs of feeling that peace and serenity and freedom for her and her life. Just, you know, and we're doing it to show up for other people and just in service of other people, but who we are showing up for them is someone who's been stripped of those basic human needs or values. Values. You're stripped of your values. It's not even your basic human needs because you may say to me, well, I'm somebody who gets a spin class in three times a week. No, it's that, are you able to live your values? And Kelly, you said something beautiful earlier about we spent all this time, half of our life getting to know ourselves, really working on ourselves. If we're lucky, you know, some of us had a lot of trauma. So a lot of my work was getting over you know, being abandoned by my father and living in a single mother household and all those things. But when you can work on yourself, you feel so proud. And mm-hmm. then you're supposed to subjugate yourself in the service of others. And that's where I think women's identity gets confused because we're hearing such different messages in the first part of our life than we do in the second part of our life, which is why ultimately I never became the Nick City dancer and yeah. the president or the senator, as we early we talked about early, but but I can come back in my next iteration as somebody being president and senator and Nick City dancer was somebody who loved to perform. It was it meant my values of performance. It meant my values of justice and fairness. And so I can still live a life that feels fair and just and has performance elements in it. And that's what I'm doing in my new iteration. So when you get back to your value system, you realize you can do it in many different ways. And I will actually ask you to have Chris do this as well, because when you're somebody who is mired in all the invisible work of having to get things done at activity level, it's much easier to say, shit, I should go grab some time to go, you know, take a run. But it's sometimes harder to remember and connect with those values. Yeah, we... I think we started to identify that early in our parenthood that there was very little personal time and that I wasn't very good at taking it. So then he immediately felt guilty asking or right, he, yeah. he shouldn't be asking me if he could right. go surf. Yes, he should yes, just yes. be like, and so we, we always stop each other when I'm like, Hey, do you mind if I, and he's like, what would you like to do? Yeah. I love it. You know, because it was, it's this permission thing, which isn't shouldn't be the language at all. It's pre- if we're we're here to protect each other's space, our unicorn space, and to know like when Chris gets out of the water and rides his back bike back to the car and throws his board in and comes home, I get the best version of him. Yeah, yeah. And our kids feel that energy shift, and he, you know, 
he's such a doer. So if he's even in our home space, like Saturday and Sunday morning, I'm like, all right. Like we may throw on our, that's our cartoon time. Like they know my kids are like cartoons, you know, and Chris and I will have a cup of coffee and then he'll like itch to get up and go like start emptying the dishwasher. And I'm like, you need to be able to relax in our own space and being, being in his unicorn space, which is outside of the house, connecting with the other guys in the water, the girls in the water where he's surfing with being creative in his flow state. Like he can only do that fully separated from his living to-do list, which is our home. And well, I love that because you just brought up two values that probably Chris would identify when he thinks about surfing, and that was creativity and connection. And I wonder if there's some more. And then what you can do with each other in your check-in is instead of saying, like, get your time to surf this week, you say to Chris, like, have you had a chance to feel connected uh, to nature and creative this week? Because it's sometimes a more of an interesting conversation <laughs> than just, you know, forcing the person to the, do the activity because there's many different ways you can get to your values. Um, like I said to that woman, she didn't have to sign up for a 5K. It's great. But we know now that in this moment of your life, you freedom and serenity are very important to you. So let's figure out a way for you to get connect with those values at least a couple of times a week. Right. Because it's, I think for me, it's more overwhelm and erasure. Like I said, I feel erased and overwhelmed. So how can I have other values that help us sort of combat the homeostasis of what it feels like to have a kid, have kids, you know, have young kids in a home, which is like hard. It is hard, <laughs> Kelly. <laughs> yeah. Well, Eve, I, I love everything that you've put out into the world and Personally, for me, it's actionable, which I it feels very different than big theories and topics that I haven't seen modeled or don't have, you know, an example or a mentor in my space who's showing me how to do it. Um, you really are that mentor, and you've given you. of us all the tools to, you know, divvy up the tasks and know exactly what we're taking ownership of, and then be able to. F- not even find the time, but but ba- create boundaries to have the time to fulfill our unicorn space and to understand our values. It's so funny that you ask me to talk to Chris about what he might, you know, what what makes him feel creative or connected. And he, it was funny because he brought up to me that surfing was more, it was just on Saturday. Surfing mm. was more to him than just a workout. He has his what he calls the bra group chat, which is like all his college fraternity (laughs) brothers that like text about whatever it may be, football, soccer, Lakers, you name it. Um, And just being funny with each other. And he has that. And then his best friend lives a few streets away, but we all have young toddlers. And it's not like they're like hanging out every week or watching a game or having a beer or whatever. It, It really isn't like that when we're in this stage of our lives. There's not a lot of time that you're, that you're, really putting on your calendar to say, this is my time to do me. And he told me, he's like, it's, you know, they aren't my best friends, but I'm out in the water. And now I know those guys' faces because we've been in the sets together at the same time. And we may have had a conversation and they'll ask about the boys or whatever. You know, I think it's, you're exactly right. It's just that connection outside of him just being a dad and a husband in our home and having his own individual self be recognized, appreciated, and, you know, without us. That's exactly it. That is it. I mean, if that was a complete summary of what we're talking about, and if that's what people take away, then we did our job, Kelly. Well, thank you, Even. Where where can people follow along? Where can they learn more? I know that um, Fair Play is also a documentary available yes, on yes. Hulu. Yes, it's on Hulu. It's doing really well there, which is great. Um, people are watching it. And I think that's a great intro to Fair Play because it's really funny. I think it's really funny. It's really funny to watch other couples struggle with the same issues because you're like, we're normal. Yeah. Um, and then I, the, I, I would say Fair Play Life, if you go to the website, we have a really great newsletter because it's really focused on science of creativity. And it's also focused on all the new learnings in these areas of boundary systems and communication. So we put a lot of rigor into that newsletter. So that's also a great way to stay in in touch with all of us. And then we put a lot of exercises in those. So some of these exercises are resonating with you. 
you'll find more of those in the newsletter. Great. And then your second book, Find Your Unicorn Space, I think is for anyone looking to really yes, preserve yes, their yes. values and find an outlet for them. There's a lot of exercises in there too, including the one that we just did around values. If you don't even know what values means, we provide you, I think, 150 on one of the pages for you to choose from because we want to make it as easy as possible to connect back to these um, values-based decisions because that's ultimately what the fair play movement's about. It's trading in assumptions for values for values-based structured decision making. Wonderful. Well, where can people follow along on social to follow yes, you? Yes, Fair Play work? Life. Yes, there's Unicorn Space Life if you want a little bit lighter. And then there's Fair Play Life, which is probably a little bit darker and, um, you know, a little bit more full of anger and rage a little bit, but also funny. Yeah. So I would say those are the best two social channels. And actually, there's a whole Fair Play movement on TikTok. I'm not there. But um, apparently my kids tell me that there's uh, so many amazing, wonderful influencers doing really fun things with, with fair play on TikTok. So great. I need to, I need to up my yes. TikTok game. Yes. Same, same. Okay. Well, thank you for being here, Eve. We'll put links to everything in, in the show notes. You guys go listen um, to either of her books on Audible, watch them on Hulu, grab the hard copies, get your card decks, divvy up your tasks. Yes and put some damn time on your calendar for you. Love you, Kelly. You're the best.